Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's broadcast of the Aegis Vanguard League. We are here for our second and final week of the play-in stage, where we will be determining who the final two teams are making it into our playoff bracket. My name is Gordo. I am joined tonight by Nyarko, and we have got ourselves a banger matchup between HOH Gaming and Northeastern University, where only one squad will be making it into those last two spots. Northeastern University managed to make it out of the first week of the gauntlet, Gordo, by beating Tempest Gaming Vipers 2-0, and we're going to see whether or not they're going to translate that victory into a little bit of momentum here against HOH Gaming. They're a little bit of the favorites here in this series, but obviously there's a lot to prove on both sides and a lot at stake for sure. Yeah, definitely is here. The HOH squad coming in off of a loss to Nameless Thieves, so definitely going to want to uh, you know pick themselves back up, come back with a win against a lower seeded team, uh, and secure the spot in uh, in those playoffs that they are looking for at the end of the day. They are going to have an E sub in today. Clocks will not be on the roster for at least game number one. They are going to be subbing in Ultan in the top lane. So going to have to deal with a little bit of a substitution there. But uh, nonetheless, I'm sure they're coming on in here hoping to have a great performance tonight. Yeah, you see the coordinated summoner icons on both sides here in the lobby, Gordo. This shows that they are ready to rock and ready to go. This is the calling card for coordinated teams for sure. And we should see what is going to happen as we move into draft phase here in just a few moments. Yeah, no, really looking forward to checking out this draft phase. Really going to be keeping an eye on the Jinx in particular, and I know everybody's sick of Jinx. Uh, it's been a whole, it's been a long 2022 filled with with arcane characters, uh, Jinx in particular. Uh, but it, you'd be remiss about not mentioning it with this matchup coming through here tonight. Hypnotic Viper and DL Forever have both really gone into this champion a whole bunch this season. Ten games of Jinx for DL Forever, eight games of Jinx for Hypnotic Viper. So you know both of these squads are going to be putting really high priority on that champion. So I'm curious if we see red side bans or, or if we see that picket traded back and forth over the course of tonight's best of three. Yeah, for sure, Gordo. I think that you probably have to ban it if you're on Northeastern's side. It is too dangerous of a champion to let through. And looking at the choices that we typically see coming out of Hypnotic Viper, I'm not seeing a lot of really solid counters. They played Aphelios once or twice here in the Aegis Vanguard League, but they have not actually won on that champion in one of those rounds yet. So with that in mind, you might as well not even worry about going for a response. Just knock it out here in the first phase. Another champion that's really hotly contested right now, moving away from the arcane theme that I'm interested to see either team pick up is the Hecarim. I think that it has kind of stood head and shoulders in patch 12.5 above a lot of the other champions that we're seeing in that role. But so far, Dorjan and Taubenzite don't really seem to be playing it a whole lot. We get one or two games locked in on either side, but perhaps the recent shifts in the meta will be enough to motivate them to grab it and bang it out here. So we're in the champion select now. First ban going to be missed by HOH. I believe that's intentional. I think they are penalized two bans for the E sub. Uh, we'll find out. I'm sure if they know what the rules applying here are. The very first ban being hovered by NEU, though, is going to be that Jinx. Uh, and we might see that one taken off the table right away, as we predicted. Would be interested in seeing that hacker that you talked about. You know, we are in that kind of meta, it feels like. Neither of these players have been ones who have really gone into it too heavily. Uh, the Xinxiao, definitely been one that both have been going towards. The Jarvan as well, uh, picks that I would expect to see coming on through. Uh, the support pools, also going to be really interesting to check on out here. Mr. Kiwi over on the side of HOH. A big fan of the Enchanters, somebody who really kind of shies away from a lot of those heavier engaged supports. The only one he's got more than one game on is that Leona. Uh, whereas, you know, Shibloom is a big Leona player. He's got more games on Leona than anything else, has some Nautilus, has some Thresh, has, you know, what you expect to see out of that engaged support pool that most players end up going for in that support position. Uh, so going to be an interesting matchup to keep our eyes on uh, to see what Mr. Kiwi really ends up busting out here. He's played a lot of interesting stuff throughout this season, had some Morgana gameplay in there, had some uh, Maokai selected as well, and quite a couple of games on uh, Janna, Lulu, you know, those kinds of picks. But his first pick is going to be the Karma. He's not going to want to let that one through. That's probably the best of the Enchanter class, uh, and they're going to lock that one in right there. First pick for HOH. 
Yeah, Mr. Kiwiism has a lot of experience on this champion. I'm happy to see it taken through here as the first pick of the game. We get a lot of pinching of the junglers in this first ban phase, Gordo. Xin Zhao Hecarim knocked out by Northeastern University, while HOH Gaming going to take out the Jarvan and the Vi. The Vi in particular is something that's kind of interesting. Maybe it is one of Talvin Zide's comfort picks, but overall, I think that so far the bands are allowing for a pretty open draft for northeastern at the end of the day they're going to lock that bully bear on in early that's able to flex into the top side of the map but townside also has a lot of experience on it in the jungle and that nautilus going to come through for Shiblong. Yeah, definitely going to be that engaged force in the bottom lane up against the Enchanter. Like we talked about, pairing that Karma with that Ezreal, a great move, DL forever. We talked about his Jinx play. The Jinx is banned away. The Ezreal going to be the next one up, especially when paired up with these Enchanters. So he's going to be happy with that one. HOH hovering the Kindred in the jungle. This would be a first one for Dorjan. And I'm just going to bring this up, especially now that you're kind of having a sacrificial bottom lane who's going to look to just kind of farm safely in that Ezreal. Uh, curious to see where they try to bring out some carry force. That's an Udyr lock-in who's going to be looking to hard farm that jungle. But Clocks is generally, you know, when he's in the roster, is one of those hard carry top lane players. He plays the Trindamir, the Graves, gets some 80 carries up there, gets some Yone up there. Uh, and he's not going to be in for this game. So I'm curious to see, you know, if they can trust their substitute to play that role uh, or if they're going to try to move some resources elsewhere. Yeah, for sure. By going for that Ezreal Karma bot lane, you will have a lot of stability and you will take away kill pressure from Northeastern, but it's going to take a while before you're really able to dish out the damage and pressure the lane yourself. So with that in mind, we'll see how the pivot across the map occurs for HOH Gaming. It's going to be a Kaisa Nautilus lane from the looks of it for Northeastern. Although Kaisa can slip into the hands of Utopian Soldier there in the mid lane, I think that that pivot will be dependent upon what we see selected to go into that top mid role for HOH Gaming. We're moving through the second ban phase now, and we already see two of these big meta mid laners taken away, Ari and the Victor. Yeah, I, I like seeing this Kaisa adopted by Hypnotic Viper as well. This is one that's really been coming up in the meta a lot. It's a classic pairing with the Nautilus. These two love to work together when they can. Really enables you to make some killer instinct plays that you might be looking for. Really lets you segment people off to get nice hits off with the Akathian Rain. Uh, so one that Hypnotic Viper hasn't gone for yet this season, but freshly buffed and freshly in the meta. Uh, also particularly good up against this Ezreal. Really gives you that chase down power in what is normally a very safe lane for the Ezreal. Kaisa, one of those AD carries who can really stick to him and make things happen. Yeah, for sure. And we will get Vladimir Rise as the last two bands of this game. Number one, Gordo and Corky will be locked on in, probably going to the hands of Utopian Soldier. Ooh, the Leona hover. I wonder what that means here. That could be a pivot of the Karma away from the bot lane, going into something like the mid or top. But this has still not been confirmed yet, so we shall see whether or not HOH Gaming will, in fact, decide to go for this double support comp. Yeah, definitely. That Corky, a fun Ooh. one to see in the mid lane. The Leona locked on in so I, I think this means solo lane karma Nyarko. it could be in the top lane uh you know we are not really uh fully scouted on ulton here don't really know what he tends to default towards the alternative would be benjamex and it's looking like it's benjamex is atrox going to be locked on in as well uh it has been played in mid lane by utopian soldier has also been played mid lane a couple of times by benjamex so this is a uh, flex pick that HOH has shown us before, uh, and they're going to go right back to it here. The Karma going to be enabling this Udyr. Ezreal Leona actually going to be the bot lane at the end of the day, and now Aatrox holding it down at the top lane. I think that Leona isn't going to be super effective within the Kaisa Nautilus lane, but they will have a solid amount of priority in which to roam just due to the fact that Ezreal is so safe bot side. Obviously, Kaisa responds pretty well as you were talking about Gordo, but there still is a chance that we will see Leona kind of moving up mid and trying to take out this Corky, as that is a champion you do not want to see scale up. Meanwhile, top side of the map, Ultan on that Aatrox. We actually saw that hovered during the ban phase. It looks like North Eastern did a bit of scouting, but ultimately decided to give this champion away, and it will be responded by, in turn, the Camille going to the hands of Ultimate Cars. 
yeah, the Camille going to be a powerful pick up against that Aatrox. Going to be keeping an eye on how Cars is going to be able to perform on that one. Uh, has himself a solid matchup and is, you know, probably by default the more comfortable of the two top laners. You know, he's with the team that he's been playing with all season long. Ultan uh, going to have to be coming in here on pretty short notice uh, per the emergency substitution standard. Um but nonetheless, HOH here, they've got a solid roster put together. I really like the Udyr in this meta. I think he's really strong. I think hard farming is a good strategy right now. Uh, you know, if you could just go in, do your full clears, come on out, be a, an, a, a little bit of itemization ahead of this Volibear, who's definitely going to clear a lot more slowly. Uh, and, you know, you got lanes that are going to be capable of playing safe here. The Karma, the Ezreal. The, even the Aatrox, they're all pretty mobile. They're all going to be able to to avoid some of these uh, really simple game plan ganks coming in through from the Volibear pre-level 6. Uh, so as long as you can avoid getting him off to a really strong early start, uh, then you should be able to scale on up with that Ujir uh, and have him be a lot more impactful later on in the game. There's certainly something to watch out for here. Talbot Knight on the Volibear is going to have to do quite a bit in the early game in order to equalize against the power farming that Udyr is capable of. And Dorjon is going to have a lot of tools at their disposal when we move into team fights. He'll just be able to run fast and smoothly with the double engage coming along with Leona, but also that speed up that comes from Karma's E. Ezreal is also someone who I think benefits really clearly from HOH Gaming's draft because you have such a clearly defined front line. You're able to position relatively well in this kind of middle ground between the backside and front, and you're able to just zip in when necessary, and you know that people will be tanking for you. Or alternatively, if a play is going south or you are being encroached upon, you are able to move far enough back to buy some time for Udi or Orleone to kind of turn around and move back in to help help you peel away from the rest of the enemy team but northeastern also has a solid roster for sure here camille is able to hex tech ultimatum one of these champions and just keep them at bay within a fight nautilus is obviously a fantastic engager that can easily start games off with great depth charges and hooks and meanwhile corky is just going to be a terror on the rift for sure if they're able to farm up and one of the things that utopian soldier probably is able to look for is the fact that benjamix is on that karma and will probably be going for one of those enchanter oriented lane builds where we'll probably be seeing like moonstone renewer maybe shirelia has come out and hopefully that means that they'll be able to stack up some gold some farm and in turn once they get their package really pop off Corky a lot still. I, I think people have kind of overreacted to the nerfs a little bit thus far. You know, it's uh, he doesn't get packaged until 10 minutes now, and he has one additional minute wait on each package up until then. Uh, but, you know, the, the core of that champion is still pretty much untouched, and, you know, that champion was very, uh, was a big staple in the meta package or no package for quite a while there. Uh, so very happy to see this one starting to make an appearance back in here and we've seen it in a lot of the playoff matches uh over in the east as well in korea and china uh also like that they've got a nice little poke package put together here uh over on the side of neu uh, they got this kaisa in the bottom lane who very well might be going for this kind of ap style build that we get to see a lot of these days uh combined with that corky who's going to be firing off those rockets there's a good amount of hard engage on the side of HOH to try to interrupt that game plan, you know, with the Udyr, especially if he goes for Turbo Chem Tank and the Leona as well. So, you know, it can't be your sole game plan, but it isn't. You got Camille to play in the side lane. Uh, you got Volibear and Nautilus to go for hard engage if you could find a good pickoff uh, onto somebody vulnerable like the Karma. So, like the flexibility that they bring with this team composition uh, and feel like they've got themselves a solid draft here. Yeah, for sure. A lot of solid opportunities on both sides to push forward and make plays. They want to get these wins here in this gauntlet, Gordo. And it'll be interesting to see which one will emerge victorious and kind of get the stage set here in round one. We are still within best of threes, so someone is going to have to pick up two of these victories in turn. The question is, who will it be? Who are you feeling at the end of this draft? The end of the draft feels like NEU is just a little bit favored. I just get nervous uh, in some of these AVL games when I see uh, not quite as much damage as I might like. And, you know, with the Udyr, who's generally going tankier these days, with the Ezreal, with the Karma mid lane, uh, I'm getting nervous at their ability to actually work their way through this Volibear. So I'm going to pick NEU for game one, but 
definitely going to be an interesting one to see where it could go either way. This is an elimination matchup, so these teams' playoff lives are on the line. The loser will be exiting without a ticket to those AVL playoffs. The stakes are about as high as they've been all season long. Really excited to get started. We're going to throw it to a quick break while we load up onto the Rift for game number one. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to tonight's broadcast of the Aegis Vanguard League of Play-Ins. We are on our second and final week of the play-in stage to determine who some of our final playoff competitors are going to be. And one of them is going to be either HOH Gaming or Northeastern University, based on who ends up taking this series. Here in Game 1 of our Best of 3, that's some interesting first-time selections by both teams. The Udyr for Dorjan, the Kaisa for Hypnotic Viper. Definitely going to be excited to see how these players can perform and who's going to end up coming out on top tonight. Yeah, for sure. I am interested to see a lot of these players pick up these champions and demonstrate their skills because, as you said, Gordo, this is their playoff lives on the line. And these are the picks that they are putting their faith into at the end of the day. We see Shivling and Hig Hypnotic Viper. It looks like they're just going to move back and leash for the Volibear. Meanwhile, Uder going to be starting top side for the side of HOH Gaming. Yeah, going to look like it's going to be those opposite side starts. So I'm going to be having my eye on that bottom lane. See if Dorjan wants to path towards there. If he's just going to go for the, you know, full clear Udyr strategy. Uh, and and got to be at least a little concerned for Oltan here. You know, he's subbing in uh, as this Aatrox is in a unfortunate matchup, an unfavorable matchup up against Cars on this Camille. Uh, and, you know, now Volibear pathing towards him. Udyr pathing away from him. Uh, you know, a lot of cards are stacked against him here. We'll see how he ends up performing. Yeah, for sure, Gordo. From a little bit of cursory research on Oltan that we did off on break, 
We saw that they were actually mostly a jungle main, really just e subbing it up here in the top side for HOH Gaming. And notably, it looks like they recognize that they're going to have to play a bit more passively early on. That is, in fact, Flash Teleport rather than the preferred Flash Ignite. Up against Ultimate Cars, who is going to sacrifice a Flash in order to go for a more aggressive set of summoner spells with that Ignite alongside the Teleport. Yeah, the Teleport I definitely prefer in most losing matchups, so you can get back into the lane. If you do end up taking an unfortunate trade, and speaking of unfortunate trades, She Bloom finds their way onto DL Forever. Gets a fair bit of damage in there. Going to have to essence shift backwards. Uh, will be able to survive, of course. Not going to have to blow any summoners or anything, but you know, down to about half HP. And no heal here on the Ezreal either. It's going to be that exhaust here uh, for once that Kai'Sa actually does come diving in. But that's going to be another dredge line landed this time onto Mr. Kiwiism. Both the bot laners here for the side of HOH could be chunked out a little bit low. Yeah, this is definitely a worrisome situation to be in if you're Mr. Kiwiism in DL Forever, just due to the fact that the wave is still continuously pushing into the opposite side. You're forced to walk up pretty far, and while you know you do have Udyr in the area for insurance, this does mean that you are leaving yourself exposed with quite a long ways to run if another dredge line does land and you perhaps start taking more damage. See, meanwhile, Dorjan just going to move over into the river, grab that Scuttle Crab. Obviously, these exchanges around Scuttle Crab have been heavily de-emphasized in Season 12 just due to the reduced value, but it's still nice to get that vision and to see where people approach from. And with those opposite side starts, I'm happy where Dorjan actually is on that Udyr compared to Taubenzite because you just are able to continue to farm up, and it's going to be harder to interfere and, and move towards the enemy jungler. That being said, across the rest of the map, there's definitely a lot of ripe gank opportunities. Either way, Ultimate Car is going to slingshot in to Ulton. Gets a nice trade in there, chunks him to about half HP. Ulton has gotten a recall off already. Cars has not, but Ulton did not have to expend that teleport to get back to lane. So he is sitting on an extra sword, uh, one less potion, uh, but still nonetheless, Cars getting some good trades in there. That's going to be a good use of the Darkened Blade, uh, as well as that W to pull back in Cars, get good trade damage. With this wave crashing in, should be feeling pretty confident that he's going to be able to farm it up just fine. No uh, dive coming on through from Tobin's like quite yet. Going to need to get up to that level 6, get that Stormbringer before you're real, real comfortable with that one, as that's going to be an engage in the bottom lane for Mr. Kiwiism. Just stopping the recall from She Bloom, trying to desync these two bot laners. Uh, Going to definitely be good value for HOH here, especially as they're trying to set up a freeze on the bottom side. Yeah, I think right now She Bloom was just a little bit too far forward right there, and in turn got heavily interfered with. This means that they will be in a little bit of a pickle regarding their itemization. That being said, they're still holding on to biscuits and potions. So at the end of the day, as long as you're acting as a source of engage, you should be decently okay um, in providing continued utility for Hypnotic Viper there on the Kai'Sa. And wow, the lane's topside, I'm very impressed with the extent to which both teams are deciding to just go for real deference towards pushes. We don't really see much contestation of the waves. People just keep kind of stacking them up and pushing them back and forth here. And that's oftentimes coordinated with backs as we see teleport being utilized by ultimate cars pretty early on just to make sure they're able to catch everything that Ultan pushes in. And that will be first dragon in turn over to blue side HOH Gaming. Going to be utilizing Dorjon's still opposite side approach to the Volibear in order to pick up that objective. At top side, left without much to do up on the top side. He was looking for a little bit of an invade. You can see he got vision down on that top uh, jungle for on the blue side. But uh, all the camps were already gone. Ultan was playing too safely for him really to go up and make anything happen in the top lane. Uh, and he sees the dragon go down, so he knows Dorjan is nowhere nearby, but he just can't make anything happen off of it. Has to just go and farm his Krugs and go for the recall there. So, great start for Dorjan here. Going to be uh, getting his team off to a good start with that Ocean Drake. One of the better ones to probably have in the laning phase. They're going to give a little bit of additional sustain to this Karma, to this Aatrox, to the Ezreal as well. And they're all going to be enjoying that one uh, in, in these lanes where they have been trading back and forth quite a bit. Yeah, everything is calm for the time being, Gordo. And that is a welcome respite from a lot of the games I feel we've been casting recently. Seven minutes in, basically, and only now are we seeing a big fight come through. 
ult on going for the all in here popping that uh that ultimate and chasing on in onto cars going to force him to dash away there and is going to go in and try to finish it here flashes in gets the last stance there gets the last hit of the darkened blade first blood going over to hoh solo kill for the substitute in the top lane yeah, that's basically the game plan right now for HOH Gaming. We were talking earlier about the damage distribution on that team, and you really need that Aatrox to get ahead here in order to be a consistent source of offense for that team. And so far, it seems to be working out. Sheeblin going in, though, with that dredge line. Yeah, lots of Akathi and Rain Triggers going on through onto DL Forever there. Takes a fair bit of damage, going to be forced to shift away. Down to just a couple hundred HP, but feeling okay. Is Tob in sight going to find himself? Mr. Kiwi is him on a face check. Mr. Kiwi might be forced to flash here, is going to expend it. Has to be a little bit concerned about She Bloom going for some kind of flash hit, some kind of flash dredge line. The out of respect, gonna have to expend that tool. No kills in the bottom lane, but summoner spell advantage goes to the side of Northeastern. It'll be interesting to see whether or not Talbanside will linger in the area. They do have ultimate up and are level six, which means that a dive is possible. And right now, DL Forever and Mr. Kiwi is and we're going to have to play pretty darn far back, even as the wave begins to push away from that tower. And meanwhile, Topside Ultan continuing to get solid trades into ultimate cars on the Camille. That is continuing to, to win this lane, at least in terms of the trades. There's a bit of a CS lead for ultimate cars up there, but Ultan is holding his own just fine down 10 cs but that's going to be more than made up for by the first blood gold he's now completed that iron spike whip too get an additional little bit of damage there in his combo uh, and it feels really good he's got dorjan covering him on this side of the map can keep going in for these trades and dorjan now looking to invade up against tobinzite here stealing away these birds tobinzite sees that it's going down but i don't know that he feels confident to stop it cars getting pulled on down that's going to be a hook landed in the bottom lane though depth charge comes on through ultimate from hypnotic viper trying to finish it off on his el forever but dl gonna survive just barely expends the flash gonna have to go for a recall but will escape with his life Ezreal is able to play so darn safe right here, and even though you are getting big encroachments by She Bloom and Hypnotic Viper, DL Forever is able to heal back up after all of that is said and done as well. Back up to about half, they are going to confidently continue to stay in lane to farm up, but this is big rotation. Yeah, Benjamex coming on down, trying to make something happen, but finds himself face checking right into She Bloom. Now here's going to come Mr. Kiwi. Trying to back up his mid laner, but the damage dealers are so low, it doesn't matter that your Leona is so high HP. So you can't really lock down both targets, and neither of your squishies can afford to stay in the fight any longer. Gonna have to back away here. Is Ultan getting ganked by Tobinzite. Here in goes the hook shot, going to CC up Ultan for a little bit. The follow-up stun gonna come on through, as does the Hextech Ultimatum, and Tobinzite gonna pick himself up the first kill for Northeastern University in the top lane. The gold going over to the Volo Bear is not maybe as valuable as it going over to Ultimate Cars, but here in the early game, I think it's relatively decent to see, especially due to the fact that that CS gap is now beginning to come into full force for Dorjon. They are at 86 versus the 68 of the Volo Bear, and this will just allow for them to grab those armor boots, and we see them both building tank and just relatively stay at parity with that Udyr. Yeah, definitely. We do see that uh, Dorshan has opted for the phase rush this game, but uh, hasn't gone for the ghost that you often see on the Udyr. Has the flash instead to try to get in there, get those bear slaps. And it does give me a little bit of pause uh, for how effectively he's going to be able to close the gap and get these engages off, even after he finishes presumably turbo chem tank. Uh, it can be tough sometimes uh, to get that enough movement speed to be able to go on in there and actually get your stuns off. Uh, when you're reliant on the longer cooldown flash rather than the shorter cooldown ghost. Nice setup on the bot side of the map for Northeastern University to just grab the second Drake of the game. Looks like we're going to be having a Mountain Soul on our hands, which will be pretty interesting into the hands of both the Udyr and the Vola Bear, as well as just a big source of defense for these top side brawler champions that we see come out for both HOH Gaming and Northeastern University. Overall, though, things are once again staying pretty steady for the time being. It will be up to more grouped fights, I think, to really define the tempo of this game. There is a gold lead right now that will only continue to grow as we see Blue Side drop Rift Herald and get a charge off onto the mid lane. But that is still not first tower claimed for either team, and not a whole lot of kills have been given one way or the other. 
Yeah, no, a nice fat bucket of gold going in towards Dorjan's pockets, though. It's 320 there. Solo uh, plate gold, it looked like, as uh, Benjamex did not actually end up getting any of it in his own pockets. Uh, but, you know, you like to snowball ahead this Uyghur pretty quickly, though, and Karma pretty effective on lower econ as well, even as a mid laner. So pretty happy to be skyrocketing that Uyghur just a little bit farther ahead. He's going to complete his CDR boots. He's going to complete his turbo chem tank as well see how he ends up uh, going on through uh, to actually make these ganks happen now he's got that extra movement speed in his pocket he can really close the gap a little bit more unexpectedly quickly Let's see if he's able to transform that into advantages for his team but otherwise a little bit of peaceful farming there in the mid lane and bot lane we're gonna hit a pause Oh, and we're yeah, that pause, yeah, that pause disappears almost immediately, Gordo. And one of the things I wanted to talk about, if we did get the break, and it seems like with the lull state, this is the time to do so, is some of the itemizations coming through. We already have that man immune built by Kaisa there. Hypnotic Viper on a pretty decent power spike. Still needs to stack up that tier a little bit more, though. But in that mid lane, one of the things that I wanted to note was the fact that we also have Benjamex, instead of going for an enchantry build, going full on into that Leandri's Torment in order to start off that lane. And maybe that is the answer to those damage woes that we were talking about earlier. Dorjon in the bot side, they're looking for that lane gank. Dashing forward, looking to maybe close that gap, but just can't do it, even with the help of the Turbo Chem Tank. Shibloom and Hypnotic Viper playing just a little bit too safely, a little too quick on their toes. They step backwards, and they are not going to be at any risk from that Udyr. Instead, just going to push back out the wave. Uh, keep stacking on up. Double Man Immune build coming through from Utopian Soldier and Hypnotic Viper. Both of these guys are going to really be looking to get those stacks on up there, get the transformation of Uramana, and get the big power spike that comes along with it. It sure seems that both are going to be building for that hybrid stance that we see. And I don't I think this is my first time seeing them both on the same team here, Gordo. I imagine that this is like relatively synergistic as you get a diverse spread of damage across multiple people on the team. But also at the same time, this is one of those items, the man immune that is, that is a little bit difficult to really leverage, especially early on. Without it being stacked, you just aren't doing a whole lot, and you still are caught out a little bit with some of the mana issues that champions, especially like the Corky, can experience. So I think we're going to be looking at an item to spike for both the mid and bot laners for Northeastern University. For sure, you are. And that's not, they got the Volibear as the bridge. They've got themselves the first dragon as well in the form of that Cloud Drake. So they're going to at least be slowing down the soul stacking a little bit as there's going to be a hook coming on through here in the top river. Dorjan locked on down, but tanky enough on the Udyr to just go Turtle Sands and start walking away. And now here comes Ulton for the collapse. This is going to be a full-on 3v3 as they're starting to lock down onto Shibloom. Shibloom going to go on down there to Ulton. Is now chasing down on Ultimate Cars. The Chain CC comes on through. It is going to be a double kill picked up here for the side of H. OH and they're gonna turn that one into a Rift Herald. Yeah, that rotation was fantastic for HOH Gaming. Ultan had enough priority over that mid lane to start collapsing down once Ultimate Cars came through. And in turn, the sandwich was too much. It first went down on to Shibling, who, you know, not at one item yet, is just not tanky enough to really sustain and walk out of a dangerous situation. And that translated over into them falling, followed swiftly by Ultimate Cars, who is just getting steamrolled. Tobbins, I'd have to watch in horror as both of their champions get knocked out here. Yeah, just a little bit quicker on the play there. They get the lockdown onto the Nautilus and then uh, can pretty easily win by numbers alone from that point on. Dorjan was the first one getting caught, but he did not really care. He shrugged it off. He felt just fine. Cars going to spot him on this recall, going to interrupt it. It's just going to make Dorjan take away your ward, my friend. He's going to stun you and he's going to walk back away, but you got no chance of taking on Udyr at this point. So that's going to be Hypnotic Viper getting caught out in the bottom lane, full all in from DL. Gonna throw on down a good trade, going to chunk him down to about half HP, going to let him flee back under the turret. Meanwhile, this push is still going on in the top lane. Cars is getting lower and lower. Rift Herald crashing on in. That's going to be Dark and Blade 1 landed onto Cars. Here comes Dorjan looking for the potential dive. Going to go on through, going to get the stun, going to get the Phoenix stance. Cars stays alive for just a little bit longer, no but it's way. not going to be enough. Dorjan stays alive. Top inner turret falling on down. They lose the dragon, but they do not care. This is a big gold win for HOH Gaming. 4K gold in the head, as that's going to be Utopia the Soldier. Blowing the package right away. This is a longer cooldown these days, but he's not going to get anything out of it. Ooh, really unfortunate situation for Northeastern University. That's for sure, Gordo. 
We saw ultimate cars getting just needled away by Ultan. I think that one of those umbral chains was what kind of decided their fate. They decided, hey, I'm gonna have to sit under tower now, especially with the Udyr wrapping around. And in turn, when the dive came through, Hexec Ultimatum was not enough to secure anything on to the Udyr. She Bloom and Hypnotic Viper just sitting under tower for the time being. We see Volibear rotating towards that bot side, so perhaps we'll get a collapse around that river. But right now, it is only two dragons up against the unstoppable force of that Aatrox and Udyr. Things really seem to be going in favor of HOH Gaming. Yeah, the HOH top side really just been dominant this game and now finally cashing out on it as they're going to be catching out on a Tauben side. Now bottom side, Mr. Kiwi starting that one on off. Dorjan chasing him all the way through the jungle. DL going to come and get his name on that one as well. Tauben side barely staying alive oh, though, but the Ezreal ultimate going to close it on out. True shot barrage puts another one on HOH's kill count. Topian Soldier getting harassed for the mid lane, going to have to back away soon as well. The big play for HOH. And this is their game plan really becoming something salient and valuable for HOH. I think that we have crested that hump in, in those worries about damage output. Right now, Dorjan is just such a menace. Look at him wrecking through this backside. Sheebloom getting caught out. And Dorjan able to tank so much in turn. Yeah, this is when it feels really good to be ahead on the Udyr. He's really farmed. He's got an item and a half done already. Got the chain vest as well. And can just run into that jungle, smack the Nautilus all day long. He doesn't really care about the Kaisa damage. Because it's not like she's going to be able to chase him down. Uh, and he can just keep getting those trades in there. Freeing up time and pressure for his bottom lane. To slam away at this turret and pick themselves up another one. We are getting closer to a Nasher's Tooth for Hypnotic Viper here. And honestly, I think that you may have just preferred to rush Luden's Echo in this case. And my reasoning behind that, Gordo, is that you need to really play far back into this team comp. Dorjan is just going to continuously run at you during any kind of team fight, and therefore the attack speed and the on hit that Nashor's Tooth gives might be relatively less valuable than just the burst damage that you can get through your Void Missiles once you have that Luden's Echo build very possible there depends on the scenario that they're gonna find themselves in but they are definitely looking like they're gonna be forced to play the poke game where they can you know definitely being behind up against a team comp like this means you're gonna want to take it a little bit slower you know the the karma hasn't gone for that uh the the heal focused moonstone build is instead ap so you can at least trust that some amount of that damage is going to stick but you got to be concerned uh, about when they pull that trigger, though. The World Ender from Aatrox, the Turbo Chem Tank from Udyr, the Leona as well. They're all going to be looking to chase you down and engage on you, so you really better be playing at the max of your ranges here because Kiwi Sim might do just that. Going to go on in, going to try to land the Solar Flare, going to pull back on Hypnotic Viper off the back of Ultan, getting a big W off, flashes on in. Can't get any more damage, though. He is eventually going to get taken out down by the turret. Multiple targets are low, but it's not going to be enough to turn that fight back around, but Dorshan is joining the fight now. She Bloom already low going to be the first one to fall on down. DL Forever manages to stay alive in the Hextech Ultimatum as the damage from his teammates is just too much for Ultimate Cars. Now chasing down on a Tobin Sight. Tobin Sight going to be the next one to fall on down. The mid turret going to join him, and that is a one fight for HOH. Disastrous play and overextension by Northeastern here, Gordo. We saw them get a kill, and they should have been happy with that, but the further engaged by Tobin Sight and Ultimate Cars meant that you just get this opportunity to go for the Baron here. Blue team really going to be ahead on this one now. Yeah, moving it into the Baron here too. 6k gold in the lead, about to become at least 7 with that big purple buff in the pocket. Now make that 8. I don't know why I'm acting like Baron's only worth 1k there. He's, he's a little bit more <laughs> as the topside dominance spreading throughout the map spreading into that mid lane as they finally crack open the mid lane outer turret and even when Ultan goes a little bit too aggressive and ends up falling down there is enough gold on the rest of this team to be able to win these fights yeah it's going to be a matter of getting picks off now in order to try to win this game northeastern university are going to have to look for anyone overextending and collapse as one onto them but so many of these champions have great escape potential as we saw earlier when dorjon was getting hit by the dredge line but she was actually the one that fell in that fight overall so things are definitely worrisome and going to just continue to grow in problems due to the fact that we now have this Baron buff on the map. This is going to be a lot of waves pushing in. You're going to have to turtle up. 
Yeah, definitely are, but the turtle is on HOH's side. It's only <laughs> Dorjan this time around. You've only got the bear, and bearing up doesn't really keep you in the game too much longer. Bear wants to go in. He's not so much at home when he's uh, playing on the defensive side, when he's hiding back under the turret. But here comes oh, Dorjan, Dorjan. Oh, doing a little my. bit of a bear impression himself, diving onto Utopian Soldier, getting the stun out, getting the Phoenix Stance too, but... Gotta step back a little bit when he sees She Bloom there. Knows that he can't tank turret all day long. At least he can't quite yet. Well, the dead man's plate. Gonna do a little bit to help him out there in the terms of armor. Still not going to be a dive they want to further pursue. They know they're winning around the map. Oltan going for a trade in this bottom lane. Gonna get dived on by three, though. He is not long for this world. Hypnotic Viper claims the kill. That's the kind of pick I'm talking about right there, Gordo. If you're able to free yourself up, especially in cases where a neutral objective is on the line, you'll be able to stack those dragons back and maybe get to a soul point. And that, I think, is your ticket for victory here. The Mountain Soul will just help you tank through some of the damage output and may exacerbate those issues we talked about earlier. Benjamix will fall off even while building AP as we see them go for a Chemtech Putrefire as their second item. But overall, it's going to be a long road and a hard foot on victory for Northeastern University if they, in fact, are able to win this one. Yeah, really a tough position for them to be in here. You know, my main concern in Champion Select was the lack of damage here on the side of HOH. But now that they've got this big lead, uh, particularly on the Aatrox, too, who's been able to get through his items pretty fast, uh, that damage concern, not really as big of a deal anymore. They've got the itemization advantage, and that can make up uh, for, you know, what might be an inherent weakness in the team comp. It's going to be Hypnotic Viper trying to get this damage in here, but without that Ludens completed, uh, you know, Mr. Kiwi feels pretty comfortable shrugging off those Void Seekers. They aren't uh, quite the menace that they will be later in the game. So far, this is actually a relatively decent Baron defense being mounted by Northeastern University. Not a whole lot has been taken. We haven't seen the coherent pushing come through, especially after Ultan was caught off on the split there in the bot side of the map, Gordo. And so that is a little bit of a point of excitement or a point of hope for Northeastern University. They're going to be keeping some of their towers up here, especially their tier twos and whatnot. So that will just allow for them to extend back into their jungle a bit more and maybe contest this next dragon up in about two and a half minutes yeah they've really staked their claim though on this bottom side jungle are really stepping in here with multiple members trying to catch out Tobinzite as he tries to step in there and make something happen he's going to take a lot of abuse for it true shot barrage doesn't quite land but the karma poke certainly does and that's going to force Tobinzite down to uh, go and head back to his fountain for a little bit. He's chunked to below half HP from just Ezreal and Karma Poke, and in the meanwhile, they're going to take this bottom lane inner turret. Yeah, we see the death ball coming through clutch for HOH Gaming. Mr. Kiwiism, DL Forever, and Dorjan just sticking together as three peas in a pod, as it were. And I really like that choice because you do get kind of a mini you get a mini representation of what the whole plan of the team is you get that damage you get that engage as well and you get that tankiness all in that package and that means that even these three champions are really difficult to engage upon unless you get the whole crew of northeastern university together and so with that in mind you do free up ultan to go around the map and try to find pressure elsewhere benjamix meanwhile is just kind of working as a secondary support at this point in the game. They aren't able to output a ton of damage unless they have their mantra up, and we see what kind of destruction that causes two champions like Tobinzite when it does land. But for the time being, we see them just kind of moving around, around the map, contesting vision, as it were, and setting up for these carries that have gotten quite a bit of gold on them. Yeah, really is... Uh so far been enabling these carries really effectively here 50 seconds to go on the next dragon you know both teams are going to have their eyes on this one benjamex taking the fight one versus two has dl forever coming to back him on up gonna trade pretty evenly damage going through onto the nautilus in exchange for damage onto benjamex benjamex gonna feel just fine though can go back into the river can try to grab some fruit if he can find it regroup with the rest of the team that is 30 seconds to go on this mountain drake number three a lot of river priority for HOH Gaming, though. They are going to immediately establish some dominance over that bot side river. And so trying to walk up into this team is truly going to be a nightmare. And I'm interested to see whether or not we actually see Northeastern University even elect to try for this for this dragon here. Obviously, 
we are not sell point for either side, so this isn't the biggest threat in the world, but you really don't want the game to be put on a timer at the end of the day. Tobin's like, gonna walk in there, and it looks like we will, in fact, get a confrontation. Torchan overslept his alarm a little bit here. It's sitting up in the top side as the dragon spawns. Doesn't really find an opportunity, does Northeastern University, to really start on up this dragon. And the poke damage is huge here. Utopian Soldier going to expend the package, dive it into the back line, but doesn't really get it onto anybody. He's going to melt on down to Old Town there. And Tobin's like going to join him. Hypnotic Viper is chased down by the Udur and is going to fall along with his team. Ultimate Car is getting chased off by Ultan. And this is a huge fight win for HOH. They've just got too much gold. They've got too much power. And they're going to win the team fight. Package could have done a little bit more, but the positioning that we saw come through for HOH Gaming basically sealed the fate of Northeastern University, Gordo. And now look at that. It's not only a dragon being claimed, but a rotation up to the Baron as well. I don't think that they can contest this at all. Tobinzite is only now going to come up. Ultimate Cars way far behind in that spawn counter. And that just means that they're going to have to watch in horror as they will have to brace for yet another huge push. Yeah, and the last inner turret going to fall there in the mid lane, too. So this push, it's got nowhere to go, but right into those base gates. Yarko, they are going to be looking to bust on through some inhibitor turrets after they get this reset off, and they certainly have got the gold to do it. That is going to be another item completed here for DL Forever. One completed for Ultan as well. Both going on in here. Going to be more powerful in upcoming fights than they were in that one that they just dominated. And I don't care how well you scale, I think at the end of the day, most people would agree that if you pass that 10k barrier in terms of a gold gap, no matter how far ahead you could potentially get later on in the game, the fact of the matter is, is that the game is nearly going to be over. You've lost so much on the map that just simply will not be the case that you're able to push past these doldrums and get to a potential victory for red side. I don't really know if Northeastern are going to be able to get out of this now looking to chase down out of Tobin's sight here. He's got the movement speed for the back of the turbo chem tank. Turning on to Viper instead. He's proc that phase rush. He is so quick now and just cannot be avoided, cannot be dealt with. Is going to expend that flash from the Vala Bear as the push gets started in this mid lane. And Jamex firing out the blasts. Getting his team safe and healthy with the shields. And just nobody can stand up to this poke deal forever. Picks himself up an easy kill there up against Sheep Blue. All cooldowns still available, but just nobody can withstand the damage. Ultan now looking to get the fight started on to Ultimate Cars. Cars gonna fall on down, and it's only three members left all of a sudden. And it's looking like Ultan's trying to make it a few less. Diving forward, dealing tons of damage to the back line, who is gonna hide back out under their uh, fountain. But so much getting lost in the base here. Two inhibitors down, and they're looking on towards the Nexus turrets. One more dive forward should be able to do it. They're trying their best amount of defense, but the turrets are just falling on down around them. All three members here have only the Nexus left. Five versus three. HOH looking to close it out here. Dives forward on the Utopian Soldier as the Nexus falls. And it's going to be 1-0 HOH. HOH Gaming pushing back against a lot of the concerns we had in this first game, Gordo. We saw Ultan really pop off there on the top side of the map. The damage did not matter. Benjamix went for that Leandri's early, snowballed the carries, and in turn, they were able to steamroll through the enemy base in a game that was never really all that close, especially after we hit that 10-minute mark. Overall, we're going to have to see a lot of adaptation from Northeastern University, I think, if we are, in fact, going to see a three-game series come out here. I was really impressed with how they played that last approach. They forced out a lot of those core engage ultimates early on into the fight, especially Vola Bears, and Corky just didn't have their package up. And what that meant was that they were able to push the issue, and on a single unified movement through the base, they were able to claim a victory. Yeah, a great game by Ultan. I mean, uh, we, yeah, we, we talked a lot of trash as he was coming in as a <laughs> jungle main substitute emergency player. Uh, and yet he did great. They they really won this game through the top side. Udyr and Aatrox really dominating this Camille, starting her off at 0-3. and three, uh, And that just bled over to the rest of the map and, and led to more and more advantages coming on through for the side of HOH. Uh, you know, Dorjan had a great Udyr game, did exactly what you want to do, farmed on up, got stronger than everybody else, uh, and then just rubbed that in their faces uh, from start to finish there. So... You know, really clean game there from HOH, all things considered. Didn't really drop anything at any point, and, uh, and now looking really strong coming into this game number two.
a lot of things to watch out for as we go through here into round number two. This is potentially the last game that Northeastern will play here in the Aegis Vanguard League for the split, and we hope to see more of them. So with that in mind, we will see how they match up, how they adapt, and whether or not they'll bring this to a decisive game three to keep their playoff hopes alive. We're going to throw it to a quick bake break, and when we come back, we will have draft phase. Everybody, panic. Hold on. <laughs> I'm about to say something really cool. Three, 41, nine, and lift off! No one dies screaming without me. I feel like I forgot to shoot something. You're starting to bore me. She's such a loser. Always ready to cry. Da -da -da -da. Ah, come on. What's the worst that could happen?
Welcome back, everybody, to tonight's broadcast of the Aegis Vanguard League of Play-Ins, where we are coming back with Game 2 of Northeastern University, taking on HOH Gaming. HOH has had themselves a solid win in Game number 1, and are now just one win away from stamping themselves a ticket to the playoffs. Northeastern, now on the blue side, going to immediately ban away Ultan's Aatrox, besides they do not want to deal with that one again. Yeah, I really like this choice here, Gordo. I think that Northeastern University realizes that that threat in the top lane was basically HOH's path to victory in this last game. Dorjon combined with that Aatrox, their top side in the hands of Ultan, to make this a dangerous, dangerous thing to play. And so, therefore, we're seeing not only the Aatrox get banned out here, but the Udir going as well. Yeah, definitely trying to take away some of the tools that were used successfully to win in game number one. So that Ujir going to be off the table for Dorjan. As is that Aatrox for the side of the HOH top lane. That high band going to stick on through versus what we saw last game. And the Jarvan going to join it. So HOH, they're changing nothing. They're still forfeiting one band due to the E-sub and taking out the Vi and the Jarvan. This means it's Hecarim hover time and it's Hecarim lock-in time for the side of Dorjan. Or for uh, Tovenzeit. And that early Hecarim pick up for Northeastern University, University Gordo, that's exactly something we were talking about beforehand. It's an incredibly strong champion right now, allows for fantastic engages and fantastic damage output, actually, once you get past that two-item spike. HOH is going to have to do a little bit more to try to respond to it this time, as this is a champion that can easily that can't as easily get zoned out of the game as that Vola Bear did in the hands of Taubenzite last game. Leona going to be the pickup once again, though, if that's going to go in the hands of Mr. Kiwiism. Yeah, that's an interesting one for Mr. Kiwi, because we talked about at the beginning of the night, you know, he's really the enchanter guy. Uh, I really would have expected to see him go for the Karma again, although it is worth pointing out the Jinx is available and we've talked about how highly prioritized the Jinx is for both of these teams. Didn't end up hitting the ban list this time. HOH though, they're going to let it through. They take the Trundle for the jungle. They want to face off against the Hecarim with that one and that means Northeastern, they get the Jinx. I don't know how I feel about the fact that they went for the Trundle second, because you could get your cake and eat it too here, Gordo, by just picking Jinx number two and then grabbing the Trundle for the third pick of the first round as, you know, you already have the jungler locked in for Northeastern University. That being said, at the end of the day, Trundle is a great matchup into Hecarim. It's probably the most common response that we actually see come through here. And perhaps HOH Gaming has something at the back of their minds. They're going to hover this Ash and maybe look at this as their chance at Redemption. This is a champion that will be able to isolate the Hecarim out by using Enchanted Crystal Arrow. You have really solid pick potential, and maybe it will slow that horsey down enough for it to be worth giving up the Jinx for. Yeah, the Ash gets locked on in. I was going to say, I have to believe this is some kind of trap and they want the Jinx to be locked in. The Leona first pick is a little out of character for Mr. Kiwi, uh, so clearly they want to play this Leona Ash into the Jinx. Uh, you know, as you said, they very easily could have locked in the Jinx here on two. Uh, and they chose not to. They instead want to be playing this lane up against that Jinx, knowing that it's going to be available and knowing that uh, all in all likelihood it is going to get selected there uh, for Hypnotic Viper. So and we'll see how it ends up working out for them. You know, both of these guys are super well aware of the power of that pick. They have both won plenty of games on it throughout this split, uh, and they have both prioritized it super highly. Uh, we'll see if HOH feel like they have the answer in the form of this Ash Leona lane. Meanwhile, the band's going to continue, going to be looking pretty similar to how they did last game. The Vladimir for HOH, they paired this up with an Ari ban last time around, and then the Victor was paired with a Rise ban for NEU. Well, you know, one of the virtues of really only playing Aatrox top lane whenever you're in that role, Gordo, is the fact that they aren't really going to be pinching out much else of your pool here. It looks like it's going to be mid bands all the way for both HOH Gaming and Northeastern University. So Ultan does have a little bit of a smorgasbord to pick from here, and we shall see what they decide to settle into. Yeah, the Corky ban from the NEU side. So they clearly feel like Corky picked by both sides pretty often here. Benjamex most played is that Corky. This time, he's going to go for the Silas. He sees an Onslaught of Shadows to steal. He sees a Depth Charge to steal. And he says, hey, you know what? That's enough for me. I'll play the Silas into anything you've got. Uh, and now the puts the ball into Utopian Soldier's Court for what he's willing to play up against that. Most of his, uh, all of his most played are banned. Vygar, Ari, Vladimir, these are the only picks 
the Utopian Soldier has played more than once this split, uh, and none of them are going to be available. Oh, the Ari Ooh. still is. I'm crazy. So maybe he goes Ari. Yeah, perhaps. And it looks like Utopian Soldier is going to put themselves onto the Karma this time around. I like this choice. It obviously is something that Silas is not super enchanted with stealing the ultimate away from. And it also will just contribute to that same kind of style that we saw come through from HOH Gaming. We were able to speed up a champion like the Udyr, or in this case, the Hecarim. And now Gwen going to be hovered as the last selection for Northeastern. Yeah, the Karma mid-tech going to be stolen away from HOH by Utopian Soldier here. He is going to be going for that one. And then the Gwen going to be the selection in the top lane for Ultimate Cars. With the Aatrox banned away, the question uh, is now begged. What does Ultan play in the top lane that isn't named Aatrox? And uh, you know, he's, he's, he's running low on selections here. He knows he has to go into this Gwen. He's going to choose the set. Yeah, the set Gwen matchup I don't think is actually super unfavorable either side. I think it's relatively balanced with set having some solid advantages early, especially if you make it out of levels one and two without taking a lot of damage from the snip snip or the um, skip and slash. I actually maybe thought we were going to be seeing the Silas go top side here, Gordo, as that is something that or Ultan played in the past, and I think that that P pivot would allow for them to just steal a much better ultimate than having to go up into the mantra for them from the karma there in the mid lane but overall things are going to settle out in a little bit more standard procedure here the set will in fact be going into his hands and we shall see how he plays this champion out yeah, indeed, we will. I, I suppose the outside chance of set mid Silas top uh, is still there. So could potentially happen, but it is probably going to be that set top up against the Gwen. Looking to just hold its own. Looking to maybe set up for some good ganks with the Trundle here later on. Uh, and then the Silas in the mid lane. Something I'm going to be really interested to check out. You know, he doesn't have the best suite of ultimates to steal from the bottom two. Uh, but, you know, he's got all that he wants. He's got two really solid engage tools uh, to be able to start fights and make picks. And that's the Depth Charge and that Onslaught of Shadows. And he's got them from frontline champions as well. So he's going to always presumably be in range to steal those ones away. To pair on up with this Leona and this Ash to make some real fat engages happen. Onto the likes of this Karma and the likes of this Jinx. So... Solid game plan there coming through from the mid lane for HOH. They got this Trundle as the counter pick into the Hecarim as well. He does pretty well there. He should be able to win on out in those duels once they do take place. And in theory, HOH likes the spot lane matchup. They had the chance to take the Jinx. They chose to take this instead uh, to try to beat the Jinx. So if that works out appropriately for them, I, I think HOH has exactly the draft they were looking for. Yeah, hopefully that was a strategic decision there and not just a little bit of a bungle in the first few selections, Gordo. But they seem confident and they seem to be drafting pretty darn well if game number one is anything to go by. They're just going to have to push through some of these more comfortable and more meta champions from Northeastern University here. That Hecarim and Jinx, two big terrors on the rift. I'm surprised that they got through the pick ban, but now that they are here, what are you going to do? How are you going to answer them? A lot of things to be questioned and a lot of things to be investigated. I really am also interested to see how Dorjan will play this advantageous jungle matchup. Everyone says that in the abstract, obviously, Trundle is going to have a solid winning, not lane, but winning jungle into the Hecarim just by virtue of being such a strong 1v1 duelist. But in the last game, one of the ways that we saw Dorjan get ahead was start opposite side and just never really interact with the Volibear, just simply farming up. Now that the tables have turned and he's on the opposite side of that equation, we'll see how aggressive he wants to be and how he will adapt to this play style. Yeah, the, the big difference here, though, is that the Trundle scales. The Trundle's going to be way better later on. He's going to be able to subjugate this Hecarim, who's likely going to go for a little bit more of a tank-focused build. I feel like most Hecarims go for the Turbo Chem Tank build this time around. Um, and we did see the Turbo Chem Tank Volibear here from uh, from the side of... Uh, of Tobin's Light last game, so I would expect to see it again here. If we see a Triforce build or something like that, uh, you know, color me wrong, it happens. <laughs> but it's going to be a lot better in the later game to try to stifle these kind of engages that come through from the Hecarim or the Nautilus uh, if he goes for Aftershock uh, by just subjugating them, by making Trundle super tanky, by making them a lot squishier, and just working through them uh, front to back with your Ash, with your Silas. 
Uh, and then all of this engage potential for HOH here, I think, really complements the Trundle really nicely. Usually the weakness of going for this Trundle, who is going to be that strong duelist, who is going to be able to uh, to scale well into the later game, is that his engages aren't the very best unless you get some really sick pillars. But with Leona Ash backing you up in the bottom lane, uh, you really complement that really nicely. Uh, and you have this Silas, who's going to be stealing away engage tools from NEU. You even have the set as well. I actually think they've ended up with a great suite of engaged, even with the Trundle. Yeah, a really solid combination of more group-oriented engage with stuff like that solar flare, but also a little bit more individualized pick potential also coming through for HOH, which allows for them to diversify their play style into Northeastern pretty darn well. Ash with that enchanted crystal arrow, basically, as long as they're able to land it, gets free reign of deciding who they want to take out of the fight for several seconds at the very least, or even entirely, depending on how good the follow-up is. And meanwhile, set show stoppering the right person can really lead to a lot of discord there, especially when combined with Trundle's Pillar of Ice. So going to have to be a lot of things for any you to watch out for. But at the same time, there's some bright spots on that team. And for sure, they really want to win this one. There is a fire in the belly and Gwen can just scale up into such a darn monster, even with those nerfs, I guess, at the end of 12.5, where that E range is reduced a little bit. The fact that you're up against the set kind of means that that isn't going to be as painful to deal with, and you'll still become a monster once you get to your two item spike of Riftmaker and Nasher's Tooth. Yeah, for sure. The The side lane plan here for Gwen, uh, definitely going to be very strong here for NEU. Uh, they've got themselves one that can't really be well answered by HOH, so HOH really going to need to lean on that engage power that they've drafted for the rest of their composition uh, to, you know, get those 5v4s uh, when Gwen is sitting in the sideline, or get those 4v4s in favorable scenarios while they're answering Gwen in the sideline, because once Gwen gets a couple items in her belt, there's nobody really here on the side of, uh, of HOH that's really going to be able to answer her effectively. So we'll see if Cars is going to be able to pull that one on out. We're going to throw it to a quick break here while we get loaded onto the draft or into the draft. We just finished the draft. We're going to get loaded onto the rift for game number two, but don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. 